Hello and welcome to the episode 8 of the Learning Guitar series. In the, in, um, in the episode 7 we discussed the, the C shape and of course uh, given the nature of the guitar as a transposing instrument we can derive all other keys just, you know, by transposing it. And uh, right now I'm actually in G, and we say that you know that this is one of our reference notes, as this is basically the root note. We looked at the scale, Ionian scale that goes with it. Some people call it this a major scale. I tend to call it Ionian because, as you will see in the future, there is more than one major scale as such, and by that I mean a scale that applies to a major chord. As you know by now, I like to see. Um, the same topic in three different manners. For me, they move in parallel. So we have scales, we have arpeggios, and we have chords. They are three sides of the same exact thing. It's just that we use chords maybe when we're comping or for solo guitar work, and scales and arpeggio might be more related to soloing. This week, we are discussing the arpeggios that go with this particular shape. Uh, there are not that many compared to when we studied the, the E major shape. But, nevertheless, there is some interesting things that come out of uh, this particular shape. And as we move forward in the future, the connections are also very important. So within this shape, I wrote the PDF in the key of D so that you can practice it, uh, transposing it up and down the guitar. As I did for the last lesson, I will not go into the theory of it anymore or showing you the PDF for that matter so that the videos are actually shorter. And also because I've discussed that before, so it's in a way it's a bit like repeating myself. So if you need a little back, if you need a little bit of background um, on how the arpeggios are constructed, the you know vertical structure, horizontal structure, etc., you might want to refer to lesson two and lesson five. Um, yeah, actually lesson two, lesson five, and you can simply go to those videos. And in the video description, I left uh, markers so you can directly skip to the section that uh, that, um, that you want to look at. So in terms of our pages, well, first of all, we have two sets of triads. That's the first one, and that's the second one. As always, you know, we're gonna practice it chromatically, right? Don't forget to tell you, tell yourself. What is it that you're playing? As in, right now I'm playing D again, okay? Because this is a D note. So C sharp, C, B, B flat, A, A flat, G, F sharp, F, E, and, you know, because that's important for your visual memory, so for the so called photographic memory, okay? And of course we do them backwards. And in alternated fashion. So basically one up, one down. Same thing for the second triad. So in this case, again, this is our reference. So this is our root note. That's D, E flat, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, uh, A flat. B, C, C sharp, D, okay? And backwards. And alternate it. At this stage of your development, I, I, I still suggest that you practice everything in alternate picking. When you stack these two triads together, you get one probably one of the most known sweep picking, basic sweep picking exercises. Right? This is like a very, very common uh, starting point for sweep picking exercises is, is this stack of these two triads. But, as I said, at this stage, I suggest you still practice everything in alternate picking because. Uh, it kind of helps you um, establishing uh, your tempo, um, especially if you're working, and you should, and you're working to a metronome, your sense of timing will improve. Uh, and sweep, pick, sweep picking, especially at slow speed, can be very deceiving in terms of you nailing your timing, okay? So before you move to that, and we will discuss uh, 
picking techniques at some point. For the sake of practice, when you're practicing, you might want to still stick to, to alternate picking. When you're playing, you know, feel free. Um, so again, in this shape, we also de can develop a major seven arpeggio. And again, same thing. Now, doing it this way, also, you are automatically practicing string skipping. So, and that cannot be bad, right? Just because you're jumping, right? From here, you're back here. Again, try if you can, as stick to alternate picking. Okay? Then, of course, backwards. And alternate. At this point, if anything, you want to start kind of trying to confuse your brain, I call it that way, uh, in terms of picking patterns. What I mean is like, it's true that we're alternate picking. So in this case, I was doing down, up, down, up, okay? And since it's four notes, that makes it very symmetrical, okay? Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. What you want to do at some point is start practicing it reversed. So start from an upstroke. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Because that, if you're not used to it, so if you're not used to have an upstroke on a strong accent, so on, on the one, basically, will kind of confuse your brain a little bit. And I find this, the idea of uh, practicing everything also reversed uh, in your right hand, Useful because when you're playing again, you don't really want to think about it that much. You just want to be playing. That 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 should be the the main idea. So try, see how it feels. So basically, this is a reversed pick. Okay, uh, up down, up down, up down, up down. And uh, same thing, like you can do it for the for the opposite direction. Up down, up down, up down, up down, up down. Up, up. Okay, and obviously. Detour aside, as I say, at this stage, since I mean, for those, especially for those of you who, who, who are joined, you know, started from the first lesson and then followed, follow me all the way up to here, might be a good time now to start introducing that. So as you're practicing also the older stuff, you might find it interesting to start reversing uh, your picking pattern. So beside major seven, we also have a major six. Okay, same drill, right? The drill never changes, right? Uh, reversed, just backwards. Also, we have a major nine. Uh, again, another interesting pattern in the future if you want to practice with big, because it has one note per string, right? So, like, makes it ideal for that kind of stuff. Nevertheless, now you'll notice that what's happening here is this passage. So you might also want to try this when you're using your third finger here as opposed to your fourth. So that that is kind of easier to do than having to go back. Okay? So that's going to slow you down. So you might want to try this. Of course, that's not the case when you're doing reversed. Okay? Same thing can be said when you're doing it. Um, sorry, that was alternated. Same thing when you're doing it reversed. Okay, might be more comfortable. Um, then we have, of course, like we have seven nine. Okay, I tend to practice these five notes or pages in two different ways. Although in the PDF I only write it, you know, once. So I tend to practice it this way. Basically, the, 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 the last notes are only played once. That makes it, from a metronomic point of view, very symmetrical. Because you have one, two, three, four, one, two, right? So if you're practicing triplets, so one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Working to a metronome makes it a little bit easier to have a reference of where the one is. But also I practice it playing two notes at the extremes and then reverse the picking. So two notes every extreme. Okay. Um, same thing. 
everything so that now. Actually, I did it on the four notes. I just realized it. <laughs> Sorry. So he's on the five notes. So one note in these streams. Two notes in these streams. So that was a seven nine, and now you have six nine. Or just with one note. Like these strings. Okay. Uh, the reason I tend to, as you notice also from the PDF, in trying and seeing the same thing from different angles, in this case is like a picking angle, is because so the brain gets used to it. You don't want the, the brain to get used to one thing. And then when you're playing, and when, as I say, when you're playing, you don't really want to be thinking about this. You just want to be playing. So your, your brain is kind of ready for possibly whatever comes. That actually never happens. I mean, there is always something that I mess up with for whatever reason, but you know, I try. Um, we've done 6 9, we've done 7 9, there is an 11. Okay, so again, you can practice with one note and two string. Or with two notes and two strings. I also wrote down in the PDF uh, the modal arpeggio, although I cheated a bit because in this particular shape I can only get to the 11th, so I added the 13. I borrowed the 13 from the shape that we we're going to do in the future, but just for the sake of exercise. So now you have this. So 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13. The reason I did that is because that allows us, of course, like you know, besides practicing the modal arpeggio, right? Also harmonize it and I wrote also like in the PDF an exercise for that. So group of three notes and group of four notes. That's group of three notes. Okay, and group of four notes. These are very important that you do them, even if at this point I haven't explained you yet the theory uh, of why I'm harmonizing the, uh, these arpeggios in three in group of three group of notes. We're developing tr the triads and the chords within, and when we study chord substitutions uh, in the future, or anyway, uh, some of the theories that uh, we get out of the of uh, normal diatonic scales, the fact that you already know how to execute them is really gonna help you, okay? So let me see. Um, in terms of two octaves, the only two octaves, mm -hmm. Is the one with the triad that we've seen before. Once we connect the next shape, we're gonna have enlarged, enlarged shapes. So um, when are we? So page two. Then at the end of page two, you have the, the cage system related arpeggio. As as I mentioned before, I like to practice arpeggios from the root note because that really helps uh, ear training. Uh, the cage system per se. So when you're practicing the scale is not really training your ears. At this stage, you are hearing it as a major, as a union, just because it's associated to a major chord. Once we do minor and dominant seven, two things will come, you know, and some of you already know this, two things will happen. First of all, we're gonna do a minor, but in terms of the finger pattern of the scale, nothing is gonna change. So, and the great things about that is everything you've done in terms of uh, intervallic studies, stays with you, you know, uh, the arpeggios will change, but not the scales and not, non, none of those studies. So, you, you know, you don't have more things to practice when it comes to minor or dominant seven. Um, so, uh, 
as I said, like the the the, the arpeggios from the root really helps your uh, ear your ear training. Okay, but also we want to study the the, the caged kind of arpeggio. And in the case of uh, the shape of C, it looks like this. So basically, we're exploiting all the intervals that we can find in terms of major seven in this particular uh, shape. So. If this is our root note, that's the major seven, and that's the fifth, and that's the third, our page is actually starting from the third. Three, five, seven, one, three, five, seven, one, three, five. So we practice this, this two. Right. Page three, you will have uh, kind of a more difficult exercise. But if you had done lesson seven, we looked at the, the progression that allowed us to practice the three scalic forms that we, we have encountered so far. So we had the progression that you know started in F, then you went to E flat, then you went to A flat. And uh, I kind of designed as an exercise the same progression, but this time applied to, to the arpeggio in the, using the cage system. So it starts in F, okay, and then it moves to E flat, A flat, F sharp, then it's E. So far, and I find it very useful. It's not very easy at first, so do it kind of slowly. Start, from, you know, maybe this kind of speed. That's F. That's E flat. That's A flat. allows you to practice the, the arpeggios you learned so far, um, especially the caged ones, and at the same time all three of them, and at the same time move uh, up the neck, and uh, I think that's a very useful thing, okay? Actually somebody asked me during the week, I think either this week or two weeks ago, uh, kind of what I preferred in between, uh, say, the cage system and the three notes per string system. Personally, I don't have a preference. I think, as I mentioned before, they, they all have advantages, okay? And in fact, for those of you that are following from the beginning, have you, you noticed that in reading lesson seven, actually lesson four, when, when it comes to scales, I started introducing also the seven shape. We've done three so far, but there are gonna be seven shape of uh, three notes per strings when it comes to scales. When it comes to arpeggios, I prefer the root note kind of starting point just for your training and then also the cage system and the reason for that is uh, because I like to relate arpeggios and scales to chords okay most of the time I like to see the chord because I'm an improvising guitar player so most of the stuff I do is rooted in harmony even if I am playing a scale on arpeggio I'm actually thinking of a chord so in that sense it's good for me and and that's pretty much the extent of it so uh, in a way like there is no uh, system which is better. So what I'm trying to say is whatever works for you and the genre of music that you're doing. Of course, three notes per strings when it comes, to, especially when it comes to scales, but also to arpeggios and certain degree, if you want to apply in the future, uh, uh, as we picking to your arpeggios, etc. There is consistency in right hand picking patterns. So that's definitely an advantage, okay? 
uh, as I said, I tend to take, at least personally, what I find good from each of them and, you know, try and develop all of them. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's about vocabulary. So the, the, the larger your vocabulary, the, the more you can adapt to whatever situation comes along and different genres. And so I don't believe in taking sides and say, okay, this is better than that. Same thing when it comes to picking patterns. I'm not advocating that alternate picking is the best picking ever. You know, I, I, I use legato as much as I use a certain degree of speed picking too in my plank. I think at this stage, from, for practicing reason, I think is good in order to get timing, to get your timing right. That, that's the only reason I think at this stage alternate picking is a good option. Anyway, let's move on. Sorry for the blah, blah, blah. I tend to do that. But at the same time, I'm thinking without the blah, 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 you should just download the PDF. I mean, I, I hope there is some useful stuff in what I'm saying besides the exercises. Anyway, the last exercise I left in the PDF is uh, relates to horizontal plank. So the previous exercise is basically us changing chords, although in arpeggio form, um, within, say, a certain area of the guitar. And that's invaluable. So that when you're playing, you're not doing this just because you don't know, you don't know that something is actually under your fingertips. I, 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 I like the idea of moving across the guitar, obviously, and I like it because we have three octaves and three quarters. Some of us have four octaves. Uh, and that's pretty much, you know, and we want to use them, but not because we are ignorant, okay? Instead, the following exercise, which is written in the key of G, it relates to the fact that even when we are in the same key, we're not changing key, we're not changing chord, we can develop horizontally, okay? So that basically, as an exercise for the arpeggio, we start from uh, G major 7, then we move to the second shape, and then we move to the third shape. In and again. And you just do that up and down just to get used to it. Right? Okay? And you can do them all backwards or, you know, uh, alternating. So you can maybe ascend in this way, descend in this way, ascending. Right? And of course you can do group of three. Group of three. Uh, and group of four. exercises you know that you can develop now one last um, um, annotation I don't know what to call it you'll have to forgive me English is not my first language as you know is these three shapes combined also uh, give light to the fact that we can play things over three octaves I'll explain myself let's look at the triads very quickly this is a triad okay G in this case now, if I move the same triad in the shape of D, I get this. And if I move the same triad in the shape of C, I get this. So I can have a, a parallel motion where my finger pattern is actually not changing. Like, so second finger, first finger, fourth finger, okay? And I'm executing three octaves of the same thing. I wrote it uh, as an exercise uh, so that you know what I'm talking about. But what's interesting about that, and this, this is kind of a technique which is often you I've seen it often used when you want to repeat the same phrases in octaves, okay? And I, I've seen it used in jazz, I've seen it used in metal. You could take any group of, any permutation of finger pattern, say I'm going to take like this scale. So basically one, two, four, one, two, four. Okay, I'm talking fingers now. Then move it. Or, I don't know, one, three, four. In this case, we're doing it three octaves of arpeggio, right? You could do it with four notes. This is basically four notes of a major pentatonic. 
Um, at this stage, I don't need you to understand, like, you know, that, that was four notes of a pentatonic uh, or whatever it is that we're applying to that particular uh, diagonal pattern. The important part is to understand that now we have the possibility of playing something over three octaves, okay? And if you think about it, say, like, I, I'll play the first six notes of G, okay? This is G Ionian. Well, this is six notes out of seven of the scale. So if I actually add this to it, and I just repeat the pattern, I have three octaves of the actual scale. Okay, so that's three octaves. The same, you know, in this case, GIO. This works when you're connecting this shape to this shape to this shape. Okay. Also, uh, something interesting that I like, person I like to do is to extend just, it's just, I know it's just one note, but is the, the D shape, which theoretically would end here, but I like to add that. Okay. You can also add the root note up here. Okay, so now you have almost three octaves. What you're missing is the major seven because it starts at the root and ends up on a fifth. But again, in the future, if you want to develop some sweep picking, that's a good place where you know where to apply these kind of things. So I'm going across three. Three shapes of the same of the same chord. So now we come to a little bit of exercising, and um, by playing. Uh, and uh, let's start from the static static chord. So basically, we're looking just at, the, at one single key. Let's start. You know, I'm going to use G, but now we're very familiar with that. So basically, we're going to loop. I'm going to use different G shapes, just you know, to make it a little bit more interesting for myself. But uh, let's look into something like this. So basically, what we're looking at is you know trying to practice the arpeggios in the in the key of G. Uh, we have, of course, we have major seven, seven nine, six nine, and the same here over two octaves. Same thing here. That's a six nine. kind of uh, difficult to negotiate, as we will see when we study the, the Lydian mode, so another major scale will have a, a different option, which actually will be more pleasant. Anyway, let's get into play.
things you can develop you know start to you know the actual the, the three octaves thing was was interesting to, to look into and now let me show you instead um, a progression so we're actually changing the chord as I said we're gonna use um, F going into G going into A I'm, not, I'm gonna exercise this in two different ways so you'll see me transitioning from one to the other first of all I'm gonna try and stay within the cage okay so using these arpeggios and, you know, again, six, seven, whatever, for um, F, G, and everything that comes with that, and A. Okay? But in times, I'm going to start using more shape for the same chord. What I mean by that, when I'm playing F, well, this is also F. So I might use this to combine it, okay? When it comes to G, of course I also have this as an arpeggio, right? And this. So I'm gonna use, you know, I'm gonna start using them all. Right? And when it comes to A, I have this, this, and this, okay? So first I'm gonna stay within the cage as much as possible. And then I'm gonna move, you know, the same arpeggio across different shapes, okay? Let's see if we can do this. Nicely and properly. One, two, three, four. on yourself is simply try and stick as much as possible to using arpeggio notes uh, and 
try and being aware of what interval you're playing. So, you know, uh, I'm landing on a nine, I'm landing on a third, it's a fifth, it's a sixth, as opposed to um, pattern playing. Uh, so it's just a finger pattern that you're kind of repeating. So at first do it slowly, right? So your brain has time to process things. In this case, I played like say one bar of F, one bar of G, and it was two bars of A. You can stretch that, you can do four bars of F, four bars of G, and maybe eight bars of A. So your brain has got time. When you're learning, you need the brain to be involved. Uh, muscle memory will build through the exercises, obviously, that you're doing from the PDFs. But for as long as you can't hear it in your head, then that, that, that means that your brain needs to be involved. And by, by hearing it in your head, I mean, this might be a little bit embarrassing, but what I mean is, um, let me do something quickly and I'll show you what I mean. So let's take the same progression quickly. I can kind of hear it and, and I could sing it to you, okay? That's, that's actually what I mean. It's a bit embarrassing, but you know, I'm not a singer. hearing it okay so at that point is not I'm not playing patterns I'm not playing my muscle memory and I'm, I'm trying to create melodies out of that so that's improvising in a nutshell although in this case we're only using three words okay so our arpeggios arpeggios in uh, in uh, G and arpeggios in F and arpeggios in A and so that's just like an ABC as we study all these exercises, you know, intervals and all the stuff that I'm, I'm kind of asking you, I'm suggesting you to practice, we're developing that middle section where I, you know, basically the words. So, you know, table, chair, sun, right? And when we're playing, we're trying to recombine them, you know, in a melodic manner and create phrases. And that is pretty much what soloing is about, right? So right now we're restricted with the amount of words we're using. I hope you understand the logic of what I'm saying, because as, as always, to me, that's the, the most important aspect of doing these lessons, that you understand the, the logic of things, uh, so that you can possibly educate yourself, okay? Um, that is it for this particular lesson. I hope you find it informative, um, and that uh, maybe, you know, helps you in developing uh, further your guitar skills, if you feel like, uh, if you feel the need of it, obviously. Um, as always, I hope you're doing okay, I hope you're safe, and next time we'll discuss um, the chords that we can develop from this shape. In the meanwhile, thank you for listening to me and for watching these videos, and, uh, and well, until next time, I wish you all the best.